Audience, please welcome Tanisha Agramanti, Director of the Office of Civil Rights. All right, everybody, I had to get my hugs in. I mean, when people take time out of their schedules and they are willing to support you by being vulnerable and sharing their stories, you have to honor that. Um, so now that you've heard some really amazing stories from our FGP panelists, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the next segment of today's summit, the Fireside Chat. First, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Jay Clayton, the Chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Chairman Clayton will be moderating a chat with our keynote speaker, Madam Treasurer, Jovita Carranza. Chairman Clayton was nominated to the chair of the SEC by President Trump in January 2019 and was sworn in May of that year. Chairman Clayton was born in Newport News, Virginia, but raised in Pennsylvania. He has a BS in engineering, a BA and MA in economics from the University of Cambridge, where he was a Thurin Scholar and a JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Chairman Clayton practiced law and was a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell and was a lecturer in law and an adjunct professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Please join me in welcoming Chairman Clayton. Now, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Madam Treasurer, Jovita Carranza. Treasurer Carranza is a principal advisor to Treasury Secretary Mnuchin in the areas of community economic development and engagement. Treasurer Carranza is from Chicago. She earned her MBA from the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida, and received executive management and financial training at the NC Business School in Paris, Michigan State University, and the University of Chicago. I have to look that up now to see what that. <laughs> she previously served as the Deputy Administrator at the Small Business Administration under President George W. Bush. Prior to SBA, Treasurer Carranza worked 20 plus years at the United Parcel Service, where she was the highest ranking Latina in the history of the company. She started as a part-time night shift box handler and worked her way up to president of the Latin American and Caribbean operation. So this is what I shared with her in the green room and what I wanna share with you. When I was looking for someone who would serve as the keynote speaker for this event. And when I tell you on the weekends, every weekend I was on the internet and I was putting in Google terms, I was asking everybody, who could we bring up here who exemplifies a first generation professional who's a senior leader? So I was putting words like humble beginning, rose to the top. I mean, I was getting really creative with the, the search on the internet. And one day this article pops up, Latina Magazine, and it had Jovita Carranza treasure and when I read her story I said that's it I found her I wrote my staff like at two in the morning on a Saturday I said I found our keynote speaker now here's the problem how do we get her here <laughs> right and anyone who works for the federal government you know there's a lot of protocol you got to go through to get so as I was trying to figure out that protocol I just happened to mention to a colleague, a colleague of mine, Peter Henry, who works at the Securities and Exchange Commission, he's my counterpart over there, I said, guess what? I found our keynote speaker for this, but I gotta figure out how to get her, and I'm getting ready to start working that through commerce. And he said, oh, okay, very nonchalant. We finished our conversation. The next day, he calls me and he goes, oh, by the way, Tanisha, our chairman is scheduled to have a chat with Madam Treasurer to ask her if she'd be willing to be your keynote speaker. <laughs> I was like, what? And he was like, yeah. The next day I was already scheduled to go over there for an initiative that he's doing. And I met Chairman Clayton and he goes, hey, did you hear the good news? She accepted. <laughs> Two days, I mean, that's how quick we circumvented all. <laughs> Yeah. 
But why that story is important is because all morning you've heard about the power of networking, right? And I don't know if they share it with you, but they said the first time that you meet someone should not be when you need them. The fact that I had already cultivated that relationship with him, and I'm looking at him and he's nodding his head, Peter, the fact that I had already cultivated that relationship with him and that he trusted me and that he supported me, that is why you have these individuals, these high ranking, powerful individuals on this stage with us today. So welcome them. Tanish, that was really nice of you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Jay, I feel like I should have Tanisha right here. I would like to sit right here. Thank you very much. Yeah, you'd Appreciate be well you. served, right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, Madam Treasurer, I'm, I'm so excited to have the opportunity uh, mm -hmm. to interview you, and I, and I want folks to know that yeah. the reason I could make that phone call was because I have admired um, your work from the day we first met, and you're just, you're, you're not only a, a terrific uh, public servant, um, you're a terrific person and a terrific American, and we're lucky to have you in, oh, in thank government Thank you very service. much. I really appreciate that, but um, don't underestimate your um, power of influence when you called me. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I didn't know we regulated the Treasury. <laughs> yeah. They say, the, the chairman is on the phone, and I'm like, oh, what? What's going on? And I thought you were going to ask me to speak again, um, but... But I was really pleasantly surprised, and it's a real honor and privilege to be here. Thank you. Terrific. Okay, well, um, this is about first-generation professionals, mm -hmm. and no one better to talk about that than you. So uh, uh, let's get started. Okay, we're good. Um, so uh, you were born in Chicago, the oldest of four. Uh, your mother was a housewife, and your dad um, a foreman at a factory. Uh, let me ask this. When you were younger, what were the conversations with your parents about what you might do when you grew up and what were the expectations? Well, I think my parents at a very early age realized I had some innate talents because I was the eldest and I was responsible for my younger siblings. And I took it, you know, willingly. I complied very, very quickly when my, when my parents were great disciplinarians, so I couldn't could not comply, uh, so I was quite obedient at a very young age, and so that developed a real um, uh, strong discipline um, practice that I had with not only my siblings, but um, respected the family and the Hispanic culture. You do know that the mothers and fathers are held, much like in other um, ethnicities, but in the Hispanic culture, especially because my parents were born in Chicago but raised in Mexico, they had a lot of the tradition. And so um, that was er an early training for me. As part of um, that upbringing, accepting responsibility and making sure that we contributed to the family well-being was very critical. So I knew very early on that I had to seek employment, uh, acquire education to really have some earning power in order to become a significant contributor to the family, being the eldest. I wasn't the son, which is typically uh, the one who takes that responsibility, but I was the eldest daughter. So um, they encouraged me to continue my education, to excel beyond the parameters that they had um, been living under. Uh, you know, I was sharing with someone that, um, I think it was my senior advisor, Kelsey, who's in, in the audience. And I said, you know, we're so polite in coming up with um, the word poverty. We give it the blue collar um, <laughs> definition or underserved or underbanked or unbanked or um, medium income or lower level. And, and I'm like, no, it was poverty. So uh, I needed to really strive to, to really um, excel from that particular condition. Wow, wow. So. Um so uh, you get your education, or you start on your education. Mm -hmm. You start off at, as, a, as a night shift box handler at UPS. Can, can, for everybody, can you walk us through that starting point to the top, of, the top of the house? Yes, we always start out with United Parcel Service, right? Because I spend the majority of my youth and my uh, young adult life at UPS. But prior to that, I started at the age of 12 helping the family, right? From um, babysitting 
doctor's children, and so uh, they paid well. So I definitely look for that type of uh, babysitting assignment. So from babysitting to helping the local store, to working in medical clinics and, and things as such, it was always within the white collar community. And so when I worked at UPS and accepted a non-traditional position like loading trucks, it was a means to an end. It paid well. It was very convenient to where I lived. It, it had a wonderful shift uh, where I could raise my, my daughter, was a newly divorcee, as, as well as attend Cal State LA uh, during, during the mornings. And I was working two jobs when I actually accepted the position at UPS. And I'm not, I'm not gonna take you through a 20 year journey, so I'm gonna speed, okay, speed down this one. But, um, but, it, but it's important to know what compromises you make in order to, uh, to make ends meet, mm -hmm. or for that matter, not consider it as a dead end, but it's a short solution, short term solution to a particular condition I was faced with. But I saw UPS as an opportunity, because of its wages, because of its location, and because it's non-traditional, that I wouldn't have much competition applying for this position uh, as a woman. Um, secondly, it paid well, and then of course I didn't have a car, so public transportation was really essential. Uh, so it met all those particular needs, and I said, this is short term. As soon as I get my degree and um, not promote from within, although I learned eventually that they had this great program a promotion from within. Anybody work here at UPS? Okay, tell me if I'm lying, all right? Oh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> or, or correct me where I may have uh, skipped something, but, but um, it had a, a great promotion from within, but I only wanted to make the first 90 days to make seniority. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, I became a loader on loader for about six months, then I became a part-time supervisor, and seven promotions later, and six relocations, is when I became uh, that executive that everyone reads about, uh, president of Latin America and vice president of the air operations. So I went from um, being responsible for zip codes on packages to a workforce to about 50 vehicles to automation, um, then to becoming a PL administrator responsible for the red and black ink of the, of the company. And all along, I realized that as long as I did a really good job and made a contribution, that was really key. Not just do a good day's job for a good day's wages. It was really, what kind of contribution am I making that's attracting them to continue offering me these opportunities? Okay, so I'm not gonna let you get away with the whole fast forward. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you a specific question, okay. which is, on that journey, when did you go home and say, yeah, Jovita, I can, I can aspire to the, the mm -hmm. top executive. But when did when did your mind shift? If maybe maybe the first day, maybe not. But but tell us. There were about two or three milestones. The first milestone was when where one employee, a union official, approached me and said, um, "You're working too hard. You're making us look bad." And I said, uh, "Excuse me, are you a seniority employee?" And they said, "Yes." And I said, well, I'm not, and I'm working through my probationary period, and I have a child, so I'm gonna work as hard as I have to in order to retain people. <laughs> so that kept me on the job, right? Um, because I worked extra hard and was really diligent. I'd get to work early and, and did all the right things. And that's when I was noticed to become a part-time supervisor. Um, so the other aspiration I had was, well, if I could do the part-time supervisor, I wonder if I could do the full-time supervisor. And then as a full-time supervisor, if I did all the right things and then by exceeding everyone's expectations that I could get the job done, mm -hmm. they then recognized that I had greater capacity than what the job they had assigned me to or offered me to work in. And so I said, well, if I could do a full-time supervisor, I can do a manager's position. And so it, just, it was just testing myself. I was, I'm not risk adverse. So I would always say, if it's gonna pay more, if it's gonna provide more for my family, if it's going to support the educational pursuits that I had for myself and my daughter, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the, that challenge. And um, nobody can penalize you for trying hard to go to that next level. And, um, and that's what I, what I kept pushing myself to achieve. But trust me, throughout every one of those milestones, I had to study very hard and research the jobs that I aspired to achieve. And 
people think that you go to your boss and you, your boss gets impressed by saying, when your boss asks you, so what do you want to be when you grow up at UPS? I listened to an advisor and I said, I want, to, I want your job. <laughs> that, that didn't set really well. Uh, he goes, really? <laughs> he goes, really? And I was just a young pup, so um, he realized that I had some growing up to do. And so I, I realized then there's a process. And the process involves not having to spend 10, 15 years doing what you did in order to achieve that level, my manager, but more so how can I accelerate that? because I don't have that much time. And, um, and the opportunities are there. So um, I did as much research and as, uh, as much observation and accepted all the training that that company offered along the way mm -hmm. to prepare me for the next move. I always was preparing for the next move, never complacent in the position I had held at the time. Well, let, let's talk about another move and you know, eyes wide open, and that is the move from Chicago to college. You were the first in your family to go to college. What, what, what was it like going to that new environment? Like my management trajectory where I leaped and, and plunged into things, uh, I did have a, a method to my madness. And when I went from Chicago to Los Angeles, I knew I had an aunt that I could go and, and, um, and collaborate, perhaps a potential or maybe temporary stay with her until I acquired my own, my own apartment with my daughter. So I, I mapped out what could happen, the do's and the don'ts, the pros, the cons, um, what if scenarios, but I didn't want to come back to Chicago. I had to be successful. So I mapped it out to where I visited California first at Los Angeles, spoke to my aunt, she said welcome, I explored the local schools, and then I made the move. I came back to my, um, to my mother's home, and I said, I'm ready to leave, and she never did believe me, um, being the eldest. You know, when, when you're in a Hispanic household, uh, Jay, sometimes leaving home is like you're leaving security or stability, um, and, and sometimes parents don't give you the benefit of maturity in a, it's some small ma maturity developing to where you think the process out. It may not be a perfect plan, but it is a plan. And so I uh, executed my vision and um, the rest is history. I lived in California for 13 years, never moved back to, to Chicago until 2006 mm -hmm. um, to uh, care for my mother and my father. But that's how long I stayed away. Good for you. Good yes, for you. it was because I traveled to many states as a result of that first move. No, that's, that's, that's terrific. Well, I'm going to shift gears, and I know that this is important to you, and you, actually you just alluded to it. Mm -hmm. um, treating coworkers, people above you, people below you in the corporate hierarchy with respect, um, keeping in mind, you've said this to me, that someday, you know, a colleague could be your boss. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Someday you were somebody else's boss. Right. Um, but. Uh, Advice for first-generation professionals um, on how to make connections with their colleagues, how to, how to connect with colleagues, and whether it's at school or at UPS or in the federal government, how, how do you make connections with your, with your colleagues? Well, I'm sure I'm not unique in, in this way where you're a woman and you're working in a non-traditional environment like UPS or for that matter when you're pursuing serving on a board and it's, it's um, it's a board that you have interest in, but you've never served on a board. So how, you know, what's the kind of conduct? What's the language? What's, what are the protocols? Um, and you can't get it, you can't go at it alone. You, you have to embrace whether it's the local community or the members of that particular association, <laughs> work site, the board, you know, even in treasury. Um, when I came into Treasury, I said, well, I'm not a banker, I'm not a lawyer, uh, I know P&L, and so how do I embrace all these financial analysts, all these attorneys, and whatnot? So, as I mentioned it in a conversation we had before, I look for the common commonalities in a person, and once you embrace those commonalities, can we build off of that? I don't, you know, I don't even like the cliche, have a glass half full, a glass half empty. Um, 
in my side, I always act like it's half empty because I strive to fill it up <laughs> all the time. Uh, I never become complacent. But people make the world go round. And I had great training compromising, um, consoling, and supporting three siblings. So I took those principles, those fundamental traits, and applied it to everything I do. So I treat, I, I learn what makes you tick, and then I try to complement that and reinforce that, as I would expect you to do that for me. Well, I, I, I've watched the, uh, the, the treasurer do this, and it's, um, it's pretty remarkable, her ability to connect with all different types of people and do so quickly and in a way that makes them comfortable. It's, it's, it's quite impressive. But I'm gonna ask a, a tough question here on this, which is um, a lot of people are easy to connect with, but we do encounter difficult people in our career. How do you, how do you manage to connect so well with difficult people? When he asked that question <laughs> before, he almost apologized because uh, he had to ask me that question, but um, it's a tough one to answer because it, it, it requires a lot of emotional intelligence. You know, working, I started out by saying that working in an untraditional environment like an all-male workforce, you would think that you'd have to put on your defenses and you'd have to safeguard um, certain language, certain posture, certain disposition. But I found that the commonalities that, or similarities that I talked about, as I am a woman, I'm a mother, and I'm a daughter and a sister, I realized that that gentleman was a father and an uncle and a brother and a son to someone. And so why not um, deal with the shortcomings, right? Um, I, don't, I didn't apologize for perhaps their shortcomings. I would address them, because I'd give the person the benefit of the doubt. That's usually how I operate, and if you don't, uh, it's always best to have mano a mano, you know, uh, as, as a respect, a mutual respect, professionalism, is to address the issue head on with the person before you share it with 10 other people or a superior. Then it's too late. Um, that's how you build trust and confidentiality, and um, it's, a sense, it's a sign of maturity. Good advice. Thank you. Go for it. <laughs> yes. You know, I, so I, I could probably write a book and I could probably keep you here for days, but when, when you go from supervising 12 people to 15,000 people in close proximity to then managing countries from Miami, and I, I had to manage employees in Brazil and Chile and Uruguay, Uruguay all different dialects, all different cultures. Hispanic is not Hispanic here in Colombia. Hispanic is not Hispanic here in Peru. So I had to learn what was important to them. In some of our work sites, they had the Virgin Mary and whatnot, but the parent company that I worked in didn't practice religion symbols or anything. So it was like, do I go there and tear it down or do I learn about the culture and the practice and what's important for them? Um, as long as they gave me the pieces per hour and the profitability, <laughs> I'd pray with them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess we are at the Department of Commerce. <laughs> yeah, I but I am a person of great faith, so I, I, I could appreciate it, but I could not, you know, um, practice what I believe was appropriate. It was really company policy and uh, programs that I had to adhere to. All right, well, I'm going to transition to something I know that you really believe in yes. um, and that I, I share your belief, and that is financial literacy and the, the, the importance of financial literacy uh, to mobility and participation in, in, in our society. Um, you've made you know, great efforts, and I, w I should have brought the report with me, but just put out a report on financial okay. literacy that's, that's tremendous. But can, can you comment on the importance of financial literacy? Um, particularly for first-generation professionals? You know, when I interviewed with the secretary, one of the things he asked me was um, how I would manage this new role, especially the section where, in my position description, it says that I advise the secretary of, of the Treasury on community economic development. 
And I thanked my good Lord for all of the exposure um, given to me throughout all the years, whether it was Michigan State or whether NCAD in, in France uh, or uh, University of Chicago, where I kept taking finance classes to learn more and in depth because I didn't have that early training um, so that I could be um, valuable to any organization, whether I served on a board or whether it was the, the private sector or just coaching and counseling individuals. The fundamentals, uh, two fundamentals that I, I lacked at a very young age was mastering math, the sciences, STEM. So going back to my interview with the secretary, when he says, well, what do you envision? I said, I envision increasing the STEM student enrollment, I said by 50%, and increasing the savings, savings accounts, opening new savings accounts for a million people. And I didn't seek out a way to achieve those goals, but it almost came to fruition that when the secretary said, and I want you to oversee the reform work of the Financial Literacy and Education Commission, I think there's an opportunity to elevate financial literacy. And so I took that as an opportunity, not a challenge. And um, so when we, we assess what was being done, we thought we could do more to have a greater impact because I lacked that when I was young. When, when I started to start saving on, because we were awarded bonuses and stocks, the only reason I didn't touch any of my stock or my thrift plan was because they told me, you'll be branded. <laughs> so I was like a fear factor. It wasn't a wise decision, it was just a fear factor. And I, you know, I, my whole life, mission now is to remove the fear of STEM from the uh, minority population because we don't really have the benefit, especially the first generation probably don't have uh, parents who help with algebra, or geometry, or calculus. That was very difficult for me. And so uh, if we can start very young, that's why I'm such an advocate of this, Anjay. Um, you know, November 5th, we're gonna have a White House event we're going to invite university presidents and, and also the sponsors of 2155 and talk about how can we institutionalize financial literacy because without that base understanding, how do you save compounded interest for, for college education, for a home? How do you know when 6% interest rate is a whole lot better than 14% interest rate and when you should consolidate your credit cards and whatnot, unless you know some basics you just keep rolling those interest rates. The banks love us, but at yeah. the same time, <laughs> we have to be smarter. When, when I came into Treasury, I learned more about the stats concerning um, the number of people in the United States that don't have enough for a $400 emergency that they have to borrow. And I thought about my family. So when we talk about mentoring, it starts at home first, and financial literacy starts at home. So I've worked on my sisters now about retirement, 401k plans, and, and things as such. Uh, because I struggle, and I know there's many in this room that have struggled. I, when I spoke at SEC, one of your people came in and says, you know, I'm trying to make a decision. I don't know if to buy stock or buy this home that my wife wants. And I'm thinking, he said, SEC, he should know this answer <laughs> faster than me. But it's a, it's a young person, probably a little under 30, and th that gap mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. crucial for our economy in the United States also. They need to be significant contributors and experience prosperity like we are now. Now, I, uh, look, uh, your, your effort in this area is so important. It is so important. Um, financial literacy, it's, it's like mm -hmm. a language. Yes. And if you don't know the language, you can't really participate, and um, you know you've you, you've made that clear to people in in a clear way, and, and I applaud you for that. And there's there's something also that you've identified for me that that goes into our next question, which is, as you get older, and you don't know the language, you get worried about revealing that you don't know the language, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Can, can you talk about not just that, but you know, how someone coming from your background 
how you deal with that, that fear that maybe I don't belong. How do I show that I belong? Do you, mm -hmm. Jumping over those kinds of hurdles, because I mean, you've, you've done it so well in your life. It, it hasn't been painless. <laughs> um, the, the growing up is very painful. It's very lonely. Um, and sometimes you find yourself alone. So someone, you said you Googled this. I didn't know I was a w weekend project, but I consider it as a, <laughs> as a compliment now because she was putting in extra time for us, right, Very, very good, yeah. <laughs> so I commend you for being such a, um, so I have such high work ethics. But um, with regards to the acceptance level, I never thought I should, should engage beyond my capacity. And so I was either withdrawn or I was tippid, or, well, nowadays tippid means something else, but timid. Uh, I would engage within my comfort zone, wouldn't broaden that mm -hmm. scope or um, uh, group. And so I would test the waters. But I, in order to be successful in that engagement, I would do my homework. I, you know, to get to this point, it's not easy, right? Um, I would either study the individuals, count the number of professionals, what kind of background, their education level. Because if they went to Princeton or Stanford or Harvard, how was I going to communicate coming from East LA or Cal State LA? We were in different spheres, but what did we have in common? I knew some things they didn't know, and if I could just um, share that bit of knowledge and know when to step out. That, that's the other thing, um, Jay. Sometimes we think we know and we're going to engage and we're, we're going to make it big. You almost look, you're almost a nuisance for people that are, all, are high achievers. And so instead, they're like, okay, thank you very much, you're very courteous, and you almost leave in a worse situation than not. So let me go back to the financial literacy piece. When you supervise a workforce, you're dealing with payroll. When you're managing a unit, you're looking at expenses, right? Payroll is one, I have to make sure the checks are going out and whatnot, and you're enthralled because signatures on that check, right? That, that's the ultimate. But then you have to think of expenses. You have budget and, and balance sheet, and now you're speaking to CFOs or um, the accountant in the company. Then you go from where they rely on you to manage the P&L, the profit and loss of an organization. You apply those same concepts to your personal life, and then you'll say, well, I need to budget, I need to save for education, I need to save for a home purchase, and I have to go through um, retirement, etc. Being prepared means you have to make some sacrifices on time. Do you go out and shop for five hours, or do you spend the first two hours learning some concepts, whether you're going to be networking, or attending a conference, or sitting here uh, with a panel? You're sm a whole lot smarter than I am, Jay. But to, to be able, but to be able I'm, to I'm gonna hold, I'm holding him. my wallet right now. <laughs> but to be able to engage with him in t intellectually and whatnot, I did my homework. I checked what Ivy League schools he attended, and I know that financial people are like, get to the point, concise. So I, I pu I'm trying to pull out of the weeds so as not to lose you. But I have, you have to study person that you're engaging with so that I can be an asset to you and you're an asset to me. That's how I look at it. It has to be a value proposition. Can, can, yeah. Can, 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 you know, I, I, can you just say that again? I'm, 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 I'm you're gonna, my asset. Yeah, I, that's, that's it. That's it. Make, make, that, yes. I, there, there's I, reciprocity. There should always be a give and take, not always a draw. Mm -hmm. because you drain those relationships. And Jay, I hope you call me again. <laughs> well. Uh, It'll be a joy. Um, you are Thank certainly you. my asset. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. No. Um, so I have a, do we have time for a few more, Tanisha? A couple more? Okay, great. Fear of failing. Mm -hmm. Put a, just, just put a point on it. How do, how do, how do we, I, I, mm -hmm. people say, how do you overcome fear of failing? I don't know that you ever overcome fear, but, how do, you, how do you work through the fear? I feared coming on this stage. You could never, it never um, is out of the picture. 
and fear and fear of fear itself is a real drain and can serve as a real obstruction to really creative energies. Um, and so I understand that there is such a sense and um, I try to deal with it. I try to succ succumb that feeling as much as I possibly can by preparing. The, the most dreadful thing a person could live through is regret. That weighs so heavy on I shoulda, coulda, woulda. And I learned that too late, coulda, shoulda, woulda. And so now the, the fear of not doing something and not demonstrating to you that I have the potential or the capacity is really serves as a disadvantage for growth. Um, so fear is inevitable, but learning how to cope with it. I'll give you a couple examples. I wrote them down. Roger Berkman behavioral assessments and profiles performance indicator and Hogan assessment. I've just about taken every assessment there's out there <laughs> to identify those personality traits that I have. So I, I'm learning about myself um, throughout the past 30 years to make sure that I'm addressing each one of those areas of either uh, weaknesses or continue with the strengths. You know, some people say, oh, don't worry about the weaknesses, capitalize on your strengths and, and work on those. But you have to recognize that those weaknesses do haunt you at times. And so you have to recognize them and then learn how to work with them. So I highly recommend, there's so much online, these type of personality assessments. Don't be afraid to find out what your shortcomings are. Because what I try to do with my executive coach is every time he tells me there's something wrong, I will try to debate it, rationalize why that particular situation didn't come out right, right? So I have an executive coach because I fear failure. I want to be successful at every engagement and I want to give back. You, like this group has dedicated personal time, they probably have their workload accumulating back there to listen to us, and I hope that what we've been able to share will benefit in some way. So I fear that I would just lose their time in a vacuum. No, I don't think you have anything to worry about. <laughs> Thank you. No, Thank not you. at all. Um, we talked a little bit about networks. Um, can you talk just a little bit about networks? And, and in particular, um, we talked about this before. I have my notes here. You, you had some great thoughts on looking at organizations and understanding organizations as part of building a, a network, best practices, accepting responsibility, those types of things. Um, how, how, what advice can you pass on about how to look at an organization and use the network in that organization? You, you talked a lot about listening. Yes. I didn't learn English until about six or seven. I was six, six or seven years of age. And even then I didn't feel real confident or proficient in speaking. So I observed uh, people's movements and body language. And so understanding an organization's culture and why it's um, like that. Uh, because the word culture was always used the past 30 years in any uh, organizational behavioral uh, assessments and whatnot. But through observation and documentation and validation is how I um, better understand an organization, even a family. Now, you know, when I returned to my family, it was 30 years later. Mm -hmm. my, my, my sisters are fully grown now. I left them at teens and now they're full adults. So that was even a transition. So you have to work situations out at home. I use, the, use my family as a beta test, but um, they, then you d practice those principles in any organization that you are, uh, that you're uh, serving in. You know, I've gone from uh, logistics supply chain to non-for-profit board service, um, a governor's board, um, a federal board, and I've gone from being a treasurer and being nominated by the president um, for another move. And all along the way, I've had to learn each organization, the uniqueness of each organization. Uh, I, I don't like, um, I, I don't have a particular bias mm -hmm. on, on mm -hmm. anything, and I don't um, judge as a whole. 
So I take the individual case and then study it. Yeah, you, you are one of the best listeners I've, I've, I have seen. I've, I've, I've never seen somebody listen to the different people around the room mm -hmm. and immediately pick up on the commonalities and the things that make them tick, what motivates them, and in different organizations, it's different things. That, that's true. The, the listening is, is a science, it's a, it's a practice, it's, a, and an, it's intentional. Mm -hmm. It's not automatic. We have two ears, one mouth, and I'm, I'm practicing only to use these two. Um, and then I'm conscious that my body language sends very submin subminimal uh, messages. And so I'm very cautious about, about that. Because if I'm tense, I make everyone else tense in the room. Or if I'm hurried, I make everybody an anxious. And so being a leader and being a very prominent leader, especially when you have your signature on every dollar <laughs> around the world. Well, have, you, have, have you calculated how much money that is yet? Well, uh, Len, I, how much did you produce so far with my name and the secretary's name on there? I'm putting you on the spot. I know we only have one more minute, but... You make 900 million a day. Oh, no, see? 900 you, million a day? That's pretty good. So, <laughs> so, right. you, so you see why it's so, so important that I conduct myself in a certain way. I, I, owe, I owe myself to you. I no longer believe, uh, um, I'm not my own property anymore because I've shared it with you, having my name on, on, this, on the um, currency. Uh, also, you've entrusted me with the nation's critical strategic assets like Fort Knox. And so, for me to be flippant or not conscientious or not thorough or thoughtful, Jay, would be, um, you know, irresponsible. So that's why I take it seriously. Yeah. You well, put a lot of trust in me, so thank you very much. Well, I'm going to, can I ask one more question? Just one more. Yes, okay. The I, boss said yes. <laughs> uh, one more. And, and, and this is a question for, for my benefit. What, what advice do you have for, for me and people like me about encouraging first generation to get into the financial world, to get, in, to get into um, this type of occupation, where, 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 where we've landed in, in, in these important jobs. What, mm -hmm. what, can I do, what can I do to make it easier for first generation professionals? That's a, that was an excellent question. I had to really think hard about that because whatever I'm going to say, you you possibly may start implementing. Um, I, I think I'd be a fool not to. <laughs> it's a way of influence. Okay, but but Jay, what 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 I learned and w how I benefited was someone having trust and confidence in me when I didn't have it. So when someone said, hey, did you ever think about going into operations? Well, I thought about it, but I, I don't know. And they said, okay. I walked out of the office, and the following week I was in operations. They saw something in me that I, that I didn't. I could, I could sense it. I, I wanted to do it, but I didn't take that extra step like asking. And I will tell you, in all sincerity, I've been really blessed, Jay. I've... I've not asked for one promotion in my life. It's, I believe in God, but uh, I, I do know, <laughs> thank you. But I, but I do know it's not being proud, I'm not being condescending to anyone here. It's a matter of you demonstrate you're ready. And the only way you demonstrate, even though you think you're not ready, this, the, the executives can, set, can, can touch the innate abilities and capacities better than we can. So the more you don't accept the answer, no, I don't think so, and say, yes, I believe you can, and give the, the person an opportunity, I think you will find that um, our workforce in the United States will be enlightened and strengthened and much more profitable. If we said yes 
or encourage people more, like you are today, um, with, uh, with, all, with everyone here, and do more of these forums, uh, that would be great. And sometimes we try to um, formulate questions for the audience. I believe in asking the audience, what do you want to hear from us uh, that would be meaningful to them? So that listening piece is important. So that's what I would recommend. Wonderful. Do more of this. Well, thank you very much. I can't wrap it up any better than that other than to say thank you for all that you do oh, thank and you, thank Christine. you for being here today. Thank, thank you, you for sharing. I appreciate it. Thank you.